Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now, did you know that every year tens if not hundreds of computers are listed on eBay as faulty or not working? And I decided that, well, someone had to step in and rescue a few. So in this new mini series, I'm going to be purchasing some faulty or broken PCs on eBay, opening them up, hopefully fixing them and then trying to sell them on for a profit. And in today's video, we're starting with this filthy HP pavilion machine. As you can see, this machine should have a Core i5 and an NVIDIA GeForce graphics card inside. Don't know if you can see how dusty this is, but it's very dusty. So let's get into it and see if we can sort this thing out. So this one shouldn't be a difficult fix. According to the seller, the CPU fan is faulty, the hard drive is missing, and the machine could do with a clean. Before tinkering with any used system, it's always a good idea to check that it works first. And sure enough, booting up the HP reveals that we do indeed have a CPU fan problem, but I suspect that this might be fixable by replacing the thermal paste and removing any loose dust. I fixed CPU fan errors before by doing just that that. Though regular viewers might disagree, I don't tend to clean PCs in the garden, but I make special exceptions for systems that look like they've been in the vicinity of or survived a volcanic eruption or nuclear blast. Removing the slotted head side panel screw, which by the way there is a special place in hell for, we can see the true extent of the grime. It pretty much covers everything, but it doesn't look ground in, so I'm guessing that this PC was used in a factory or workshop environment. It looks as though this thing got really dirty really quickly and not gradually coated over a number of years. My tools of choice for cleaning this machine include a microfiber cloth, my trusty electronic air blower, which has honestly been one of the best purchases I've ever made, and last but not least, a number seven makeup brush. Now the last time I wore makeup was in the late 90s when I decided that out of every single mammal to exist in the animal kingdom, I wanted to turn up to my school's fancy dress day as a pink rabbit. I borrowed this brush from my sister, I'll leave a link to her channel sewn by Sophie down in the description. The first thing to do here is disconnect everything from the motherboard, all cables, power connectors, everything. Some connectors can be quite stiff, especially inside these OEM HP systems, but they will all come loose eventually. I then turned my attention to the system memory. This computer has one 8GB stick of DDR3 RAM, which is still perfectly acceptable in 2021. It's the graphics card I think we should be worrying about, to be honest. We'll remove that next. This is held in place by another cursed slotted head screw, though once removed, the card slides right out of the PCI Express slot. This is the original graphics card that the system would have shipped with. We'll talk about just how terrible it is later on, but for now, let's get the power supply out of the system. HP OEM PSUs are generally reliable in my experience, though with a 180 watt rating, it's a good job that our graphics card is so weak and bad. The DVD drive needs to come out next, which involves removing two screws, the front of the case itself, which is held on by plastic clips, and then just pulling the drive out of the front. Next up, it's the system fan, which is held on by three screws, this time crosshead screws. This thing has got more variety of screws than my local hardware store, to be honest. Getting the motherboard out is trickier than it should be. I don't have a Torx screwdriver to remove the IO shield itself, so I had to remove it all as one unit. This might be the way HP intended anyway, but it just makes getting the board in and out a little more awkward. With our components out of the case though, here comes the fun part. The now empty chassis can be cleaned by using a combination of the air duster and microfiber cloth. 
There's nothing quite like the satisfying and electronically assisted removal of dust. Unfortunately, I misjudged the wind direction, so now I can confidently say I know what a second-hand PC tastes like. Sometimes I dampen the cloth as well just to make sure that I get all of the dirt off, though this case does have a few age related marks that won't budge. How a case looks won't affect the performance. The front of the case, the plastic part that we removed earlier to get to the DVD drive can be cleaned the same way. It's a simple matter of placing it outside, firing up the air blower and then removing the more stubborn stuff with a cloth. A small brush, like our makeup brush, might also come in handy here to access any awkward curves and corners. So far so good, and with the case cleaned, it's time to deal with the internals. For the RAM, I'm going to gently run the brush over the entire module. According to my sister, this is a decent uh, brush, so the bristles don't come out. I hear conflicting advice about using brushes all the time, but honestly, I've never killed a PC part like this, and I don't think you will either. For the system fan, it's again the turn of the air blower. This never gets any less satisfying. Before I had one of these, I just used to use a cloth to clean the fans, and honestly, you may still need to after blowing it with the air duster because fans generally gather the most stubborn dust. These Foxconn fans are actually pretty decent in terms of noise levels. Perhaps the easiest part of any PC to clean is the DVD drive. Usually a simple wipe with a cloth is simple enough. This isn't that dirty because it's been protected by the plastic flap at the front of the PC case. Moving on to our weak but reliable power supply and for this I'm using a brush to clean the dust around the wires and connectors. This isn't really necessary as it won't affect the computer's operation but it sure does make it look tidier. The power supply unit itself is best cleaned with an air blower. Don't try and take it apart and clean the fan by hand especially if like me you like living. Seriously though, a quick blast from the air duster will be sufficient and the PSU actually cleans up really well. This goes back to what I was saying about the dust looking quite recent. It hasn't had a chance to get ground in yet. If you have a system like this one and you want to upgrade your graphics card, then you will need to swap this PSU out for something more powerful, as a 180 watt unit won't really power all that much. With a handful of components now clean, we will turn our attention to the motherboard, which looks as though it got caught in a snowstorm. Either that or this PC belonged to a certain Mr. Escobar. We'll put the CPU to one side for now and turn our attention to the board. Again, I thought that we'd need to clean this more thoroughly, but all it seemed to take was a quick blast of air. Seriously, I'd recommend this CompuCleaner Duster 1000%. It's 50 quid on Amazon at the moment, which is almost as much as the PC cost, but I would have gone through about 500 pounds worth of compressed air duster cans by now. This board really has come up well. I'm going to put the RAM module back in here for now and then move on to the i5 processor. Isopropyl alcohol and a cotton swab will take care of any dried up thermal paste. Just make sure that the processor is dry before putting it back in the system. The CPU fan can also be cleaned the same way, though you might find that the paste on the bottom of the heatsink requires a little more force to scrape away. It may take a while to get it completely clean, but it's worth the time. Refreshing the thermal paste is one thing, but if your heatsink is still clogged up with dust, then you might still have temperature problems. Every time I remove a fan from a heatsink, I expect the worst, and I think I was actually right to do so in today's case. This is what I expect to be causing our CPU fan error message. You know the drill by now, I'm sure. A quick course of 
electrically powered air followed by a wipe from the microfiber cloth will do wonders on this component as well. It might take a while to get all of the dust out from the little cracks and crevices within the fan but it's worth spending some time on to do so as the cleaner you get it the first time around the longer the time between cleaning it again. Now a question I see all the time is how much thermal paste do I use? I mean all of your favourite tech YouTubers have probably posted one or five videos on the subject on their channels, but the answer as far as I'm concerned is simple and doesn't require 10 minutes to explain, just a pea sized amount. It works fine every time, no crosses, zigzags, spirals, smiley faces, just a pea sized dot in the middle. Let's take a look at the terrible GPU next. You thought the GT710 was bad, right? Well, let me introduce you to the GT705. I'll have a couple of benchmarks at the end of the video, but I'll be doing an in-depth review of this card in a couple of days' time because, believe it or not, this thing does support DirectX 11 and will run, or at least start, most of your favourite games. The heatsink is held on by these plastic squeezable pins that once pinched will detach the heatsink from the PCB. This little thing is full of dust. Sometimes it's hard to gauge just how dusty something is until you start to clean it. I'm going to give this thing a fresh helping of thermal paste as well. Cleaning the chip can be done the same way as the CPU, isopropyl alcohol and a cotton swab. The same thermal paste can also be used, although we will need a smaller amount here as the chip is tiny. And once I'm done, I'm just going to push the heatsink back in place. Usually you will need screws, but this one just clips back onto the board. This card is still terrible, but at least it should be running cooler. To finalise, I added a second hand 1TB hard drive to the build. The seller was kind enough to include the screws necessary to hold it in place, and once this is in our PC, it should be good to go. But there was still a problem. We were still getting the same error message as before, and as it turns out, the CPU fan is actually broken. It wasn't the dust after all. Now I do hope that the fan is at fault and not the motherboard connector, so to test this out, I borrowed another fan from a different system. I'll remove this metal grated part as it looks pretty silly in my opinion and the fan blades hit it as it spins, causing it to make a noise. As you can see though, it was indeed a fan problem. Now I don't think I've ever experienced a CPU fan failure before, but I guess it does happen. With our system reassembled and running like new, you might be wondering what it can actually do. The i5-4460S is a low power version of the standard 4460, though with 4 cores and threads it's still fairly capable these days, and the GT705 is a visual representation of sadness. Remember, this system was sold like this brand new, so I can imagine that a few users have been left disappointed over the last 6 or 7 years. I ran a few games to test the stability and temperatures of the system if nothing else and both the i5 and GT stayed at sensible temperatures throughout my hour or so of gaming. The first game I tested was GTA 5 which at 50% of 1080p gave us a similar to console frame rate. I was actually surprised at the result here. I thought for sure that the 705 would do way worse. As you can see the i5 is barely breaking a sweat, despite this being a CPU intensive game. The graphics card is just holding us back too much. Fallout New Vegas is a bit of a stuttery mess even at 720p low, but it isn't uncommon to see 60 frames per second on occasion even when we're running around the New Vegas Strip. This is a great low spec game but it can be quite juddery with weaker graphics cards. There are plenty of mods which aim to combat this though and ones that will certainly help us out here.
Finally, I ran CSGO at 720p, but the system failed to hit 60 FPS on average, even with low settings. An even lower resolution is likely needed for that, but just like in the previous tests, the graphics card is holding us back. Still, with our system cleaned up and working as it should, it can now be sold on as an everyday PC or a light gaming system to someone that can get some use out of it. And maybe they can even upgrade it too. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed our HP Pavilion repair today. If you did, leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.